welcome to the third part of this webcast lecture about France in the early 19th century. This part of the lecture deals with the July monarchy of Louis Philippe, the Orleanist constitutional monarch who was brought to power in the revolution of July 1830. After being installed as king, essentially by the acclamation of the Paris mob, Louis Philippe did in fact implement some of the reforms he'd promised the crowd, including an extension of the franchise so that uh, about a quarter of a million French people had the right to vote in 1830 following the July Revolution, as opposed to around 80,000 beforehand. There was a, a general economic liberalisation and state-sponsored attempts to start a railway industry. The process of industrialization and relative pauperization of the French countryside began to take place, as it had done in England 20 years beforehand. The Bourbon period really had frozen France somewhat, uh, and the same forces were unleashed in France as had been unleashed in England, and with the same result of increasing conflict and increasing repression. So Louis Philippe, who began as a very popular figure, a democratiser, a liberal, um, the bourgeois king, the citizen king, um, in favour of Parliament, became increasingly reactionary. At first, Louis Philippe had allowed his ministers a fair degree of autonomy and didn't interfere directly, but particularly with the ascent of Guizot as Prime Minister, um, Louis Philippe was much more in evidence, much keener to prevent the further spread of the franchise, much more monarchical, far less liberal, as these reactionary trends were taking place at the level of the state. In civil society, there was a new factor in French politics, and that was socialism. The intellectual trend, which was French socialism, doubtless had its roots in the idea of e equality or egalité uh, from the French Revolution, that everybody ought to be equal before the law. But in Hegelian terms, of course, if you simply give everybody equal rights, that doesn't mean that they're going to have equal prosperity or equally a good life. In fact, the connection between individual rights and market competition in in sort of the system of Adam Smith and David Ricardo leads to increasing inequality to inegalité. The French writer Henri Saint-Simon, who was active in the 1820s and a supporter of the July Revolution in 1830, um, advocated a form of state control or state socialism in order to prevent inequality flowing from the formal equality of the law. This would be done, he thought, by remodelling the state so it was run by technocrats, by the leading capitalists and technologists who would plan out the society and one of their aims would be not simply to raise the general prosperity of the country in a mercantilist way, but to raise equality at the same time. So it's a kind of modified mercantilism to replace the laissez-faire system of capitalism and free markets. In fact, he called his system savoir-faire as opposed to laissez-faire. Saint-Simon was a socialist in that sense, a state socialist. Um, inspired by Kantian ideas, I suppose, of altruism, that it was necessary to, uh, that it was a moral good to raise up the poor, uh, and this was a moral good in its own right. He was a Christian believer, but wanted to simplify the religion down to its, what he saw as its basic premise, that the purpose of life was to find the poorest people in the world and look after them. That's sort of what Jesus would have done. He, he cared about the sick and the poor and people who needed protection and therefore a truly Christian society would be state socialist and planned uh, in that way to look after the poor. Saint-Simon was not particularly democratic in his outlook. In fact, he appealed to the Bourbons uh, monarchs to implement such a system to use their non-democratic central power uh, on behalf of their subjects to raise them all up by using forms of uh, socialist type planning. So you can see how in Saint-Simon uh, you have the um, roots really of totalitarian socialism, socialism that sees, the, sees it as the role of the state 
to recreate the people as some kind of perfect socialist community. Essentially, it's a Hegelian view of the state, that the state uh, is the agency of good in, in the world. Uh, the state, according to Hegel, is God in the world. And what God wants the state to do is look after the poor and that state socialism. Another influential socialist whose ideas were very widespread in the Paris of the 1830s was Charles Fourier. Fourier is thought to be the originator of the word feminist because he felt that women ought to be treated exactly equally to men in all respects. Fourier had an extremely detailed plan for the recreation of uh, all of human society and all of human civilization. He believed that there were exactly four classes of people um, and everybody needed to be sorted out through the education system into one of these four classes. Then everybody, he thought, ought to live in a place called a phalanx, which um, was a sort of cross between a barracks and um, a hotel. And he, he drew up very detailed architectural plan plans for these places. Everybody would be assigned to a place in the, in the phalanx. On the top, and the, these phalanx buildings would have four floors. On the top floor, um, the people with the most money would go there. and But they would be the people who did the most horrible jobs because um, you would be assigned to a, a class of being, I don't know, um, a toilet a cleaner or something. That's a horrible job. To persuade anyone to do that, you'd have to give them a lot of money and they'd be at the top of society. And somebody at the bottom of society, I would, I would think a musician, something like that, they'd get paid hardly anything and they'd be on the bottom floor of the phalanx. He also believed that there were exactly 12 types of personality. Sounds very similar to Kant's idea of the 12 categories of possible ideas. Um, 12 common passions, which when you permutated them, meant there were 810 types of character. He thought there ought to be a state system to ensure that only people of the same character got married. So that meant in an ideal phalanx you would have exactly 600 and, uh, sorry, uh, 1,620 people. Um, he planned to build 6 million of these phalanx barracks, each with 1,620 people in them. And that would accommodate the entire population of the world. These phalanxes would be coordinated by a world ruler called an omniarch. Uh, and he would call a world congress of phalanxes. And delegates would go, each one of these buildings would send one delegate to these, um, to these congresses. Uh, and if you did all that, he thought, then you would achieve a perfect socialist world. And amazingly, it might seem to us, he was taken quite seriously. And some and attempts were made to build these phalanxes. In, in some in North America, one was built near Houston in Texas and uh, persisted for a while as a sort of commune. Uh, but then, uh, you know, as you might expect, fell to pieces in all kinds of ways. Very simple. The Fourier people would simply blame the fact that the rest of us had not participated for the failure of their general scheme for the complete reform of human society. This discussion of French socialism continues in part four of this webcast lecture about France in the early 19th century.